Thank you, Lord. That's why we pray and don't give up. Amen. Why we don't give up. Because he can make a way where there seems to be no way. No way. Just when we would think, well, maybe, and it's like, nope, the word. See, our circumstances don't change. You need to catch this. Got your listening ears on this morning? Amen. Your circumstances do not change the promises of God. Your circumstances don't change the word of God. They don't change the promises of God. Amen. And they will be tested. They will be tested. Every single one of them. They'll be tested to the umph degree. It's like if you're going to have faith. Because without faith, what? You can't. You can't please God. So we want to please God. He who believes in him. He who. He says he, we must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I read something this week that, you know how the Chinese have symbols and pictures for their words, uh, for their words. Well, perseverance is a knife in the heart. It's like when we, that's the picture of perseverance. When your heart's bleeding, when it looks like your, your heart broken over a situation, it's like you persevere, you just persevere, you persevere because you know the Lord cannot fail. He'll not fail. We just sang so perfectly this morning. It's just these songs just minister to our hearts and faith comes. Hallelujah. Honestly. And another thing I've noticed how faith works, I've noticed this in a few situations, but definitely with Paul and Janelle, they celebrate with everybody else. You just, it's hard when everybody else is getting married and you're not, or everybody else is pregnant and you're not, or, you know, or it just seems like every, there was a point where a whole bunch of pastors were all getting their vision and they're all getting their land and they're all getting their churches and we still didn't. It's like, it's just, you just praise the Lord anyways. One part of you wants to go, that's not fair. Amen. With our circumstances, we can look, we can compare with neighbors who didn't raise their kids to love the Lord. And we poured in and taught them the ways of the Lord. And, and then situations arise and we go, that's not fair. But it's like, nope, I will rejoice. I will trust I will praise him. Amen. Even with Job tested, he said, though the Lord slay me, I will still praise him. It wasn't the Lord doing the slaying, but he was being tested like fine gold. And there's times where that's what it feels like. We're in the crucible. We're in that, in that place where it's like, I don't think my heart can take anymore. And then, and then three other things happen. And it's like, well, you have to. You're in the fire, right, Lydia? It's like, go put them all in the oven, and they all go in the fire, and you feel like there's times just like, can I tell, the thing feels like it explodes. It's like, feels like your heart explodes, and your life is just flying in a million pieces. And it's like, I will trust the Lord. My circumstances don't change the word of God. His word, his promises are yes, and they're amen. To the glory of God. We say the amen, so be it. God says yes. Yes to you, and yes to you, and yes to you, and yes to you. Yes, yes, yes. And we say amen, so be it. All of our children are taught of the Lord, and great shall be their peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. And he's dealing with their hearts, and he knows how to discipline those who he loves. We did our best. As parents, we did our best. We, we loved, we taught them the word. We were up early in the morning praying and reading a word and taking them to church a couple times a week and doing everything we need to do. And then it's like, then we just say, God, it's just so much easier when they're all little and you tuck them all into bed. If you're at that stage, praise the Lord. Look at those sleeping little sweaty heads and kiss them goodnight. Gil and I used to go around every single night to all the bedrooms and just stop and stare at each one because they sure looked so cute when they were all sleeping. Make sure they're, 
their blankets are up to their shoulders. Now we get to do it. I go, could you check Livy yesterday? She wasn't quite in her blankets. And so you just, that's as hard as life gets. It's so sweet. So sweet. Anyway, hallelujah. We are going to get to the word. Here we are. In the word, we're still in Acts. We're just going to overlap just a tiny bit to give it context. We're in Acts chapter 8, verse 4 here. Father, I thank you for your word. It's living and it's active and it's powerful and it has found us at, at such a time for such a time as this, Father. We need the whole word of God. So, Father, as we look into your word, we pray we'd be sharpened, that our eyes would be focused, that we'd be able to see clearly and we would be prepared for uh, whatever is ahead, Father. Give us discernment, we pray. And Lord, sharpen us. Do a work in us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's saints said, Amen. Okay, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs that he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now, for some time, a man called Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them, they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Peter and John placed his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent, turn from this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. And when Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So there's the passage. Again, we don't have the edited version here. We've got the whole word of God, and it's all written, as the Bible says, for our warning and for our instruction. So we are going to examine error and examining ego-centered religion. Ego-centered religion versus, we were actually talking about this this morning, weren't we, Marlene? Ego-centered religion versus relationship that exalts Jesus. So, so I'll give you my points again, and then we'll go through them verse by verse. Eventually, we land up at our destiny, and then the genuine is evidenced in predictable experiences, then exposing and examining the ego, and then how people eat up this ego mush, I call it. Ego tries to amaze us, and then everyone is not on the same page, and ego tries to entice others by money, and ego must be exposed, and ego-centered religion has no place in end-time revival. Those are the points this morning. So examining um, the error. 
So the first point that I felt like God wanted me to uh, stress here is that God um, eventually gets people where he wants them in spite of some of our errors, some of our mistakes. And um, one of the situations here is that they land up in Samaria, which God had said to them in Acts, was it um, 1 verse 8, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, and they eventually get there. And uh, as well here, um, what God had highlighted to me, so there must be a good reason why he wants me to go there, and I think we sang about it this morning, that we get, he gets us where he wants us to go. And he's talking about, in the previous chapter um, in Acts, he was talking about how Ab the history of Israel, Joseph and Abraham and Jacob, and each one of those uh, situations, the examples in the word, they're not without mistakes or error. Um, none of us go through life without making a few mistakes. Amen. But what God was showing me is that he eventually got everybody, all these situations in their destiny that he wanted them to get, which is comforting because many times we wonder how, in spite of our mistakes along the way, because we can look at every situation, Abraham made a mistake. He thought he would help God and Jacob and Esau, they had their issues and Jacob had to go away. And Holy Ghost took me back to, to that. And it gives me um, this whole thing in, in Acts chapter 7. It, it talks about, uh, about the famine striking Egypt. And go, they all had to move. And they found out there was grain there. And then in the end of all of this, it said that they, they, their bodies were bought, brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought. For the son. So in the long and the short of it all, then the Holy Spirit gave me uh, Psalm, where was it here, Psalm 14, and I was like, okay, God, what are you actually saying? The last verse ends in that Jacob rejoiced, let me read it here, oh, that help would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. So I hope you're following my drift because I felt like God was on this, on my journey here. And it's like, what are you saying, God? And it's like, in spite of our personal errors and all of these examples given in history in the previous chapter, that eventually God's sovereign hand leads us where we need to go. And that's what we were singing about this morning. So I felt like God was just confirming that. Might bring hope to your heart if you've made some mistakes along the way that at the end, it's just as God had planned. That's comforting. Again, our circumstances can't change the will of God, doesn't change the word of God, doesn't change his promises. He's got a way to get us going where he wants us to go. You think of, I could give many other examples, Jonah and whatever, but that's not what the whole sermon is about. That is just... Uh, eventually we end up in our destiny because uh, I was listening to Bethel um, Church and, and he was saying how that DNA, that will of God was written in our DNA. And God's word says he's prepared good works in advance for us to do. Amen? And he wrote them on our heart. And that, again, is very comforting because we have like a GPS on the inside of us. And deep down, we know when we're going in the direction that we're going and God can correct our destination. Have you ever took, taken a road trip of some sort? And it's like, uh, maybe you weren't very good at directions. We've had a few experiences like that with my girlfriends where we set off uh, to get to somewhere in the States or whatever. It takes you a little longer, but eventually, that's the first point, eventually God gets us where he wants us to go. Amen, we got there. Hallelujah. So that's number one. And then genuine, genuine gospel is evidenced in 
predictable experiences. We look at a good example in this passage and a bad example. We see what does Philip do? What is the gospel? I'm not ashamed, Paul says, of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. So Philip preaches the gospel and he preaches baptism and he preaches with signs and wonders and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all in here and change lives and the result it says in verse 8 is so there was great joy in that city. Wherever the gospel, the full gospel is being preached, not in part, but in whole, when the whole gospel is being preached, it, it changes people. Amen? The gospel, did it change you? It's meant to change us. When the gospel is being preached and we receive the good news and uh, apply it, then there's change and the result is great joy. What is the kingdom of God? His kingdom is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. So we see the genuine here is very predictable. And so you could see in churches worldwide where the gospel is being preached, the whole gospel is being preached, not in part, because if you just pray, preach, receive Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, and you end it there, you've got a lot of people who still need deliverance. You see, a lot of people who need to be baptized, crucify that old, bury that old man before he can be raised to newness of life. We might think, oh, what's the big deal here? A little bit of water. So it's like, no, the gospel is powerful. It is the power of God unto salvation, unto sozos, unto changing, transforming situations and whole regions and then we'll find great joy in the city because everything is the way God wants it to be his kingdom is established therefore Jesus said go and preach the kingdom is come call the kingdom of God into the fullness preach the whole gospel so that you could have this great joy and we saw um, what were that just the Lord's bringing to my mind those that series on a revival all over different parts of the world. Transformation, I believe the, the, the movie was called. And towns that were so cursed under witchcraft and um, no, it was like barren, not producing anything. Families were split up and the guys were all drunk. They all drank every night. Horrible towns like this, revival came in and instead they closed down all the saloons and open churches and the produce, the carrots were like the size of a man's arm. They were just, so God transforms, amen. So the gospel is evidenced in predictable experiences where we see true revival. And so we just keep preaching the gospel everywhere we go because we know the end result, what will it produce? Great joy, righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So that is just laying that foundation. Now we want to look at the opposite of that, the extreme opposite, exposing and examining the ego. So what do we say about that? The end of it, the story just like there's an end of this story, great joy in the city, the end of the ego-centered religion is also very predictable. The end is inevitable. It's inevitable. So their purpose is, the Bible says here, it said in the chapter 5, verse 38, if the purpose of this is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you won't be able to stop it. If it's of human origin, it will fail. It's doomed to failure. The end of it is inevitable. Amen? So the counterfeit is not equivalent. Counterfeit, ego-centered religion is a counterfeit. It's not equivalent. It's not equal. The genuine power of the Holy Spirit, the gospel, go spell it out to the people loud and clear. Amen. Go spell it. This is what just came to me. What is the gospel? Go spell it out. Spell it out to people. What happens when you receive Jesus Christ? If you receive him, he gives you power to become sons and daughters of God. Amen. And so this, the counterfeit, Satan is just a copier. 
Everything's copy, copycat, imitate, imitation. And so how do you tell the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit? And we've, uh, I had a sister who worked in the bank for years and years. What you do is you study the genuine so thoroughly that you know the feel of the paper, the shininess of things, the picture, uh, the hues of it. You study, you look at money all day and your, your chances are that you're going to recognize this doesn't feel right. There's something a little bit different about the feel of it and the look of it and the, right? So it's a counterfeit. It's not the real thing. And the counter, counterfeit has no fruit. So we hear in God's word, I just wanted to read it. Val had read this this week. It was like, okay, where is that? Where did you read that? Glory to God. So uh, that was um, Galatians chapter 5. 5, and it, I'm reading it out of the message here. It is obvious. Aren't you glad it's obvious? The opposite, extreme opposite. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. All-consuming yet never satisfied wants. A brutal temper. An impotence of love or to be loved. Divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parod parodies, whatever that is, of community, I could go on. So, there we have it. <laughs> Yuck. Amen? So... How can we tell in this particular example? Well, here, here it is very obvious. Again, that word obvious. Now, for some time, a man called Simon practiced sorcery in the city. So, again, the source of their power. Don't, don't think that there's no power or he wouldn't have been able to amaze them for a long time. He amazed the people uh, for a long time. And... He boasted. Here's another thing. The source of it, Satan, magic, anything counterfeit is fruitless. And so it just bears no fruit. And he boasted that he was someone great. So again, ego-centered religion. It's all about self rather than exalting Jesus. Amen? So he boasted in himself, and he said, I am someone great. Not only that, um, but the people gave him their attention, it says in verse 10 and 11. Everyone gave them their attention. Ego-centered religion loves attention. It's an attention-grabbing thing. It's all about self. Some of you here will remember we had a guest recommended by somebody at one point years ago. And somebody said their ear, they could hear, and this person was reputable. And he comes and he says, I healed her, I healed her. Okay, at the end of the service, uh, excuse me, you'll have to leave and you're not ever coming back. <gasps> I healed her, I healed her. So ego-centered uh, religion boasts, likes to draw attention to self and accepts praise. Everybody said, he is truly the one from the great, the great, uh, called the great power of God, all with capitals. He is truly, so again, deceptive. We can be deceived. We can be deceived if we don't look for the fruit and the obvious. Jesus said the fruit is obvious. Amen. So not only did he boast and give himself praise, everybody else gave them attention, and he accepted the praise. 
Whereas in an example with Peter, when he healed the lame man, and they all went to worship him and think he was a great God, he said, do not look at us as if by our own power or righteousness, this man that you see that is healed stands before you today because of the name of Jesus. He was healed in the name of Jesus, and it is by faith and faith in the name of Jesus that this man stands before you today healed. It does not accept praise of man. It gives, exalts Jesus. Amen? To see the difference here is very, very important. And so they like attention. They, they praise and boast about themselves, and um, it, they accept the praise of man. And we think of many, many examples, the braggy king of Babylon, and then he lands up going, in, uh, going insane. It's like we have to give the praise and glory to God. It's a dangerous place, amen? Very predictable, inevitable. Their end is inevitable. And um, as well here, we don't see any evidence of Philip truly repenting. When he's told to repent of the evil... It says, pray for me that what you said is going to happen isn't going to happen to me. He's only concerned about me, my reputation, what might happen to me. Amen. So that's that one. But this next point, people eat it up. Eagle mush. People like eagle mush. Because it's just kind of, if you recognize that our human nature, there's something about, do you ever see people do the magic shows and stuff and card tricks and everybody goes, oh, oh, ah, wow. We like to be wowed and amazed and that is amazing. So we have to recognize that there's something about us, our old nature, that we just read all about uh, gets attracted and we can fall for that kind of stuff but again it's no fruit it's not about helping others it's not about healing others it's not moved with compassion for others that's not even in the consideration it's not to draw people to Jesus it's to draw people to self and and the bible says about the lawless one eventually talking about the son of the about the antichrist the lawless one will use displays of power that serve the lie and the lie we all know is to say that the antichrist is someone great and that they worship him and so it says that the result is they persist because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Now, I don't know if you've ever met anybody that does witchcraft or tells futures or, or gives you a message from your grandma who is dead and all that kind of stuff. Um, they want a power. They got a power. It's like, whoa, that's pretty amazing. How did they know that about my grandmother? Well, I see a little place here. <gasps> yeah. And they tell you stuff that is like, oh, who here has a birthday? I'm sensing there's somebody in the room that has a birthday in May. How about anybody here? Oh, yes. I, oh, I was feeling that. And we're all just like so amazed. And when you were a girl and you, you celebrate your birthday, you know, they could just make up stuff that just so. And I've seen this kind of junk. And we have to see through that. Uh, the, the end result uh, they, is to amaze, to dazzle, and to impress. And uh, the word in, in there, it says, um, in that Second Thessalonians, there's many passages that deal with the counterfeit and the fruit of that, but they delight in the wickedness. They delight in it because they eat it up like mush. Amen? And here in a contrast in that Second Thessalonians, it says, but you were saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Here's the difference. 
One comes to draw you to Christ, to sanctify you, to make you holy. We're singing about the holiness of God. Well, the word tells us, you be holy as I am holy, but you are saved. Here's the difference, the contrast. You are saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Spirit? I am so thankful for the correction. You know, someone else could try to correct me, but when the Holy Ghost comes and corrects me, when I open up my Bible and I go, what are you saying to, to that, Lord? And it's like, okay, let's just be honest here. We all can have a little problem with ego. And it's not thinking too much of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself too much. And they work hand in hand. A lot of times it's a, a deflated ego and an inferiority complex. And, and it's not thinking, think of yourself no, no high, more highly than you ought. Amen? And don't look to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. And here we see the difference of one's drawing attention to self and the other is they want people to be sanctified and changed and glorifying Jesus. Give him all the praise. You know, it's not hugging, thank you, you healed me. It's like, praise Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Exalting Jesus. So that's sanctifying. So that's, that's that. That's how we, there's the difference. It's. People eat it up, but the end of it is inevitable. And then next we're going to look at not everybody is on the same page. So within the church, amen, this is where we have to be so careful is because if there's some counterfeit, it's just sprinkled on the in between a whole bunch of other bills. And when they're, do you ever see people count money just like that? It's like, how do they do that? But anyways, but then all of a sudden one's feeling a little bit different. So if, if something's not really, do you ever get that check in the Holy Ghost? Something's just not right about this. I don't know what it is, but anybody else smell a rat? Where, have you ever smelled a mouse? I got a real good nose here. And getting the Christmas decorations out once, I would get the Christmas box out and it was like, I smell a mouse. So I called my, my, my mom's husband, beautiful man, Jerry, and I said, Jerry, could you help me get the Christmas tree out? Because I'm sure I smell a mouse. And sure enough, there was evidence that there was a mouse in my box, in my Christmas box. But there's, there's evidence, amen? So it's sprinkled in between, in between stuff. So not everybody is on the same page because Simon's right there with everybody. And it says Simon believed. And he was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere. He was at every church meeting. He was front and center, right there, right in, right in the mix. Amen? And so everybody's not on the same page. The Bible said even the demons believe and tremble. Amen? So we have to be aware. So don't follow people, and don't follow signs, and don't follow, but follow Jesus. Amen? And another thing... Uh, going back to first point, Philip preached the gospel. He preached the word. Okay, ego-centered religion. This is where you really have to be not judgmental. <laughs> Amen. Not judgmental. Because um, that can be all part of it too. They have a, a terrible craving for controversies. We're not to walk around suspicious and thinking, I think they... They're one of the counterfeit. But be discerning. Amen. We can be careful here. Yeah. Moving right along. It's mixed in. And we will know each other by their fruit. We will know one another by the fruit. Evidenced in love and good deeds. Amen. Amen. So moving right along to verse 14, when ego isn't the issue, being equipped or discipled by others, making room for others, valuing others in the body of Christ isn't an issue. Amen? I don't have to be everything. I'm so thankful that I, I'm, you'll be thankful, that I'm not leading in praise and worship. I love to sing, but I would not be the praise and worship leader. 
I would, I'm not the teacher. I have, there's Grace's gift of teacher. There's many teachers, children, teachers, wonderful people with the gift of teaching. And we teach as well, but we don't have to be it all and end all. We don't have to be the be all and end all where the counterfeit does. It's very competitiveness and all of that, which we read about in here. So they have to ask John, uh, they asked for John and Peter to come because they weren't all baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. So they're getting help from Jerusalem. They're getting, they're asking for help and that's okay. So now P Philip takes the back seat and brother John and Peter come in and they're praying for, and when they saw the ba baptism of the Holy Spirit were given by the laying on of their hands. But the, just to stick to the point, it's like you're going to see that in the body of Christ where you have the real, the genuine, or you have the counterfeit. They don't like to share attention. Amen? And we are a body. We are a body of Christ. And that's why we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we're not threatened when it's somebody, else's, somebody else has a powerful testimony or an answer to prayer or may I pray or whatever the situation. They don't have a problem for that um, in that situation. So next is ego tries to entice with money. Okay, so wherever there is evil, now money isn't evil. We believe God wants us to prosper and be in health even as our souls prosper, but we're not seeking money. As we seek first God's kingdom and his righteous priorities, all these other things are added to us. But he's so desperate for power. He said, I'll buy here. I got a lot of money here. It's like, I'll oh, put in a big offering. If you give me this ability so that when I lay hands on people, they can receive the Holy Spirit too. It's like, Okay, so again, a lot of times where you find something off is you're going to say, do you ever hear the line, follow the money? Even politically, politicians, uh, when it comes to the abortion industry, you, wherever you find something's fishy going on here, it's like how many billions of dollars is this person making who's not even a doctor who's behind this whole thing? It is just like just... A good point to scratch your head and go, there's some money behind this. Just saying. Amen. Just saying. The love of money is the root of many evils. And again, it'll be evidence. You'll see a lot of evil. It's like wait long enough. If people don't believe it, then eventually it's evidenced. Amen. Amen. The next, ego must be exposed. No punches here. May your money perish with you. Now, I looked it up in several different uh, translations. May your money come to destruction. May your money condemn you to hell. May your silver go to ruin and you go with it thinking the free gift of God can be bought. May your money go to hell. That's pretty pointed. And Ephesians 5.11 says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in darkness, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. So here again, Peter gets a word of of knowledge and he says for I see so all of a sudden Holy Ghost is peeling back the darkness we sang about the light peeling back the darkness and he says I see that you're full of bitterness and the word of God says in James where you're where there's selfish ambition you'll find every evil practice every evil practice so again it's obvious to see because just like we have the fruit of the Spirit. It's not called fruits. Love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness all wrapped up. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. But where you find the other, what we read just read in there, it's the opposite of that. Amen. And he says, I see that you're full of bitterness and you are captive to sin. 
Again, you dig long enough in the one that looks good. It looks all good and glittery on the outside, but their private life. And God exposes that. And that's why we expose lies, because if you don't expose a lie, it sits there. It has power. And so if you believe in God is showing you something, ask Holy Spirit, just like Holy Spirit shows him that he is actually a captive to sin. And he says, may you, may you go to hell with your money. Go to hell. May your money perish with you. And then he, uh, we see Philip. He's saying, pray that none of this will happen to me. And we're just moving right along here because he doesn't even deal with them anymore. It closes uh, uh, with that last point. And after they have further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. You just keep on doing the genuine. You keep on doing what God has called you to do. We're not surprised. Jesus said there will be wheat and tares. Just leave them till the end of the age. It'll all get sorted out in the wash. Amen. But we need to know in advance that ego-centered religion has no place in the end time harvest. It's not going to bear any fruit. It's not going to change any lives. Amen. Look to the fruit. If it's all about the person, this is all about you. Amen. Or it's all about me. <laughs> but no, we're exalting Jesus. We continue to further proclaim the word of the Lord. Why? Because the word of the Lord has power and to change lives by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Deep down within each one of us, we need to ask ourselves. We're not shying away from preaching the whole counsel of God in this place. And there'll probably be a lot more people here if we did it. But we just want to present to you. We're not telling you everything what to do. We're just saying, look for the signs. Look for the signs. Unless you learn to be a discerner yourself, you're going to be deceived because of selfish, egotistical motives. You need to say, is what I'm believing because I want something? What's in it for me? Well, what if I don't do this? Then, so it doesn't serve me. It's obvious. Self-serving. And that's where we have to come with a challenge to finish what, on a challenge, not to finish too heavy. But I myself, I have to ask myself, because I'll get to walk this out before I even get to preach it. How is this looking? I, and I can't deny there's times it's like, this isn't, this is, okay, so this has nothing to do with you, Anita. Like the time the Lord said, uh, do you take the credit when things go really well and the place was busting at the seams and the first few weeks we got all the chairs and I said, no, Lord. He says, well, then don't take the blame when, when it's not. It's like, okay, so we need to stay in the middle of the road. Amen. We need to know when conviction comes and say, am I walking a holy life or was there a little bit of ego going on here? Was it a little bit about me that I'm applying this pressure to people or, or is this about Jesus? And is about God's will. And is about Holy Spirit reveal truth to us. Amen. And that's where I'm just feeling, oh my goodness, this, the presence of the Lord. We need this discernment in the end times very much. If we use entertainment for ego, if it takes entertainment to get people in the seats, or if it takes ego feeding, ego mush feeding people, ego, ego mush uh, to get them in the body of Christ, it's like that's going to happen. That's how people are going to be deceived in the end times. Is this, or is this gospel truly exalting Jesus and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit? Am I becoming changed? Am I becoming more like Jesus? Am I preaching the gospel? Am I going to the uttermost ends of the earth? Am I ashamed of the gospel? It's the power of God. Am I admonishing my brothers and sisters daily as long as it's called today? 
Or are we walking by fear? Or are we walking by faith? Are we walking by what serves Jesus? Are we asking him? Amen? And so repentance is a daily thing. I don't know about you, but it's a daily thing for me. I don't get through 24 hours, much less probably three hours without saying, sorry, Lord, I, I could have done better there. That was a lazy way out, or that was thinking of myself a bit too much, or this, right? And you keep yourself, it's like steering the road, uh, keeping in the middle of the road. you got to constantly be going this a little way, this a little way. You take your, your hands off the wheel for two seconds to take a drink of, of water, and you'll find your car just going veering off. So we constantly have to keep that tension there. But we've got to make sure in the end times that we don't develop an appetite for ego mush because it's not about us and then we will see I want to see the results I want to see revival and there's great city joy in that city because there's transformed lives amen we're being sanctified day and day become becoming more like Jesus tell me if I ever stop becoming more like Jesus Amen. We should be looking at each other and just say, uh, just to let you know, brother, since I trust you, uh, look each other in the eye and say, if you, if you sense I'm, I'm veering off, can you just go, uh, like my good friend Grace, she doesn't mind. She, she knows I can take it. She'll just say, uh, what's chapter and verse for that? And I'll go, you caught me. Amen. If I'm not talking faith, don't go talking like that. Don't go speaking that. Amen. We we we're okay with that. That's healthy. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Glory to glory to God. Well, we got lots of vegetables, meat and vegetables, and we're gonna have a, a song of praise for dessert. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you love the word of God? Amen. We're eating some pretty hearty vegetables today. I was fixing my roasting pan. And I was in the garden this week going to the Mennonite farm and picking rutabagas and carrots and onions. And, oh, come on. Oh, here's beans. Let's pick beans. And we're having the kids help us pick beans. And you just get this beautiful array of vegetables. But I thought, okay, children, I'm knowing. I'm thinking, how many carrots will I do and how many rutabagas and how many beets? Because the kids probably aren't going to want to eat those. Because you know what? If we just eat what our palate likes and we don't train our children to eat the whole thing, and we, that's the word of God. Amen? So if the shoe fits it, it's like, okay, I don't really like that taste of that. It's because maybe that's the very thing. Your body needs that. I tell my kids, if you don't eat carrots, your eyes are going to have nothing to work with so that you can have really good eyes and you don't have to wear glasses. So then... Oh, maybe they're willing to just eat a carrot. Amen. So let's praise the Lord. We're having cheesecake for dessert. Amen. <laughs>